Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining us for your online coffee break. Have you ever thought about what it would take to go faster than light? If you're like me and love science fiction and can't wait to the day that we can go to another star in just a few minutes or a few hours, then you'll love our guest today. Her name is Dr. Erin McDonald, and she's at the perfect intersection of science and science fiction. Dr. Erin is an astrophysicist, a science fiction consultant, an aerospace engineer, and host of the online series, Dr. Erin Explains the Universe. Her specialty is in general relativity, having worked previously searching for gravitational waves in the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. She has since found her home in science fiction, consulting with writers, teaching STEM through popular culture, and fulfilling her life goal of becoming a warp drive expert. Online Coffee Break. Thanks for joining me today, Dr. Aaron. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh, it is our honor. Now, I would like to know a little bit more about your background. I mean, you're an astrophysicist, but you're also a science fiction consultant. Tell us more about what you do. Yeah, I really wear two hats. I like to say it's that I'm a a rocket scientist by day and a warp drive expert by night. Awesome. Yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, So my background is I studied physics and astrophysics and mathematics um, in Colorado at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And then I went to graduate school at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, where I got my PhD studying gravitational waves with the LIGO collaboration. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Colorado to Scotland, that is amazing. Um, So you're obviously the much smarter one of this bunch tonight. (laughs) Um, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we're we're going to dive into something a little bit foreign. Um, the concept of faster than light. And, uh, you know, I love just so much about light, light speed. There's so many things we can talk about. But as I understand, according to your incredible YouTube series, Dr. Aaron Explains the Universe, we have to talk about space time first. And this is a yes. loaded question because I heard recently that William Shatner has been going around trying to get people to explain the concept of space time to him and no one can do it right. So I'm going to put you on the spot and oh, ask you, man. how do you define to viewers and listeners the concept of space time? Yeah, I have to clarify that William Shatner has not asked me yet. See? So, yes, <laughs> this could be it. Yes, right. Uh, The idea of space-time really is that our universe is four dimensions. It's three dimensions that we understand being forward, back, left, right, up and down, Mm -hmm. and that we can control those. We move within that space. Uh, But we also have time as a fourth dimension that we don't have control over, but we're continually moving forward in. And so when you combine all of those together, you have this four-dimensional universe that is made up of the space that we move around in and the time that we progress progress in. Uh, A lot of people have seen a bowling ball on the trampoline analogy for gravity. And Einstein really took this concept of this fabric of space time, this four dimensions, which is very mathematical because our brains have a hard time conceptualizing what four dimensions are. Especially mine. Um, (laughs) I have trouble with three. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you can break it down, though, and really think about, all right, let's introduce a mass into space time. And you can mm-hmm. see it warp in the same way that you put a bowling ball on a trampoline and you see it bend down. And then that's how he started thinking about gravity and how mass interacts in our universe, which is, you know, our study and what we, we understand and we're able to test. OK, now, how does that translate? Let's talk about light now. So light speed is incredibly yes. fast. Tell us more about how fast light is, how fast, how long it takes to get from one place to another for if you're a light beam. Yeah, so the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second, which okay. means nothing. <laughs> it's a lot of zeros. You can come up with <laughs> a lot of zeros. You can come up with a lot of explanations or analogies for it. Um, but the one I think that resonates the most is it's just this idea that light takes time to travel somewhere. Mm-hmm. And light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. So we say that the sun is eight light minutes away from us. Mm -hmm. So the light that we're seeing now is what the sun gave off eight minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Um, But the speed of light is the fastest anything can move in our universe as far as we understand. Mm -hmm. It's our physical limit. 
The reason for that is when we talk about that bowling ball on the trampoline, that's mass. That is, you know, matter uh, that is bending space time. The less matter you have, the lighter the bowling ball is, the less it's going to bend the space time. And when you eventually get to no mass, you're just going to coast along the surface without bending it at all. The heavier you are, the harder it is to travel through space time. So the lighter you get, the flatter space time gets. And then you just end up in flat space time when you have no mass, like a photon, a particle of light. Then you just coast along flat space time at a fixed speed. And so that's why that's our maximum speed that we can travel. It's that fixed no mass speed. Well, wow, that light just happens to do. Yeah, that, that is so amazing. You are so good at explaining this concept. I, that <laughs> yeah. was amazing. I, I think it's wonderful. So obviously, light it it takes time to get from here to there. So you know, sun eight minutes, Mars it can be twenty minutes longer yeah. than that. So obviously, there's a need as if we want to explore. I say the universe, but my gosh, just the nearest star. It would take what four years, yep, going exactly. at the speed of light to get there. So hence the concept. We we want to travel faster than light. So we've all seen this in our popular sci-fi shows. Did any of them get it right? How's that work? <laughs> yeah, so basically what it is is if you want to go faster than light, like you said, for interesting fun science fiction to explore our galaxy and explore yeah. new worlds and, and all of all of those monikers oh, yeah. that they come up with, um, you do need to cheat and go faster than light. And uh, the way that you can do that is to say, okay, we can't – we cannot travel on the surface of space time in a traditional way faster than the speed of light. But there's nothing saying that you can't bend space time or punch holes in it or that space time itself can't move faster than the speed of light. So these are all the concepts that science fiction tends to use to cheat these. So you typically see about three or four main ways of traveling faster than light. Mm -hmm. uh, we have wormholes, those are holes. Uh, I can go into more detail on those. Um, we have jump drives where you bend space time to you and then you jump and unbend it. Mm -hmm. Or you warp space time around your ship so space time propels you through, through, uh, through space. And uh, that is kind of the traditional warp drive. That's the idea behind okay. that. I love that. Let's start with wormholes. So I, yeah. I think on your videos you call oh, another name for those is jump gates. So like point to point. Tell us more about wormholes. What are yeah, they? so stargates, wormholes, any of those, um, those would be this idea that space-time, we think, our whole universe, we think is flat. There's a lot of studies for this. Cosmology is the study in astrophysics trying to figure out what the shape of our universe is. Um, as far as we know, on a broad scale, it is flat. But we don't know if maybe we're just ants on a really big beach ball, you know, yeah. <laughs> that it, it may be a different shape that we don't understand. But even on a local level, there may be some warps to it. So the way I Im imagine it is that you take a bunch of toilet paper, crumple it up, flatten it all out. On the whole, it's flat, but you still have these bumps and ridges. And a wormhole is that if you want to travel through space traditionally, you've got to travel along the surface of every single bump and ridge. Um, but a wormhole would be punching through. That would be a shortcut to shorten the time it would take to travel. And in science fiction, they have these sometimes naturally occurring. We see that maybe in Star Trek Deep Space Nine or in something like um, Stargate. They have Stargates <laughs> that are sort of artificial ones that go through space and time that are fixed. But they, you know, uh, you can start in one spot, end up in another, that they've built this artificial shortcut that will punch you through to a different part in space time. See, I love that, artificial shortcuts. Now, what I understand is Battlestar Galactica takes the different approach. They use the jump drive. Correct. Tell us, tell us yeah. more about what that means. Yeah, and I really like the way Battlestar Galactica does it, the way they describe it, because they talk about the need to spool it up, they talk about how much energy is required to do it, and they talk about the red line. And all of those are this idea that basically you're in one position in space-time, you say, I want to go there, so I'm going to pick up there, or I'm going to bend me to that spot, and then jump and unbend it. Now, the thing is, is that if we're going to bend space time, we need mass. We need that bowling ball. But Einstein came up with another physics concept called energy mass equivalence. More commonly, E equals MC squared. Right. Energy equals mass. So if you don't have the same amount, you don't have mass to bend space time, you could use an equivalent amount of energy in order to do that. 
but that would be a lot. And that's why we don't typically see this done in science fiction because the energy required even to conceptualize the energy source would be so much. Um, and then the thing I mentioned about the red line, that's just this idea that you can map out where things are moving within our own universe mm -hmm. um, to a certain extent because chaos rules, you have the butterfly effect. And right. so beyond the red line, you don't know what it's gonna look like when you suddenly jump there. And so that's kind of the concept behind that. And they handle it the way they talk about it is all done really, really well. Wow. Now, this last one, uh, I understand this is actually your life goal. You want to become a warp drive expert. So tell us about <laughs> warp drive, hyperdrive, warp bubbles. What is all that? How's yes. That so I always joke about it because I, uh, when I was doing my dissertation for my PhD, I was procrastinating and realized I was getting my PhD in general relativity and I could calculate how warp drive would work. <laughs> and, <Wow. laughs> and, you know, so I, I, I did. <laughs> um, but really the whole concept behind it is you basically build a warp bubble around your ship and then that bubble moves through space time faster than the speed of light. Now you can exponentially increase that speed by building a bubble on top of that other bubble and then another bubble on top of that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we think of as warp factor two, three, four, as you, as you increase warp factors, you're increasing the bubbles that you have um, to a physical limit where you would be bending all of space and time around you, which they call warp factor 10, yes, as we saw that. in uh, Voyager. <laughs> don't go over that. <laughs> so, um, cause terrible episodes happen. Yes, they do. <laughs> Um, you come out looking like me after warp 10. It's horrible. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but that, that's the idea behind it. And again, just like the jump drive, like I said, you don't have the mass to be able to bend that around your ship. Um, but you could use the amount of energy. And there are physicists who have spent the time, more time than me, trying to calculate the shape of the bubble, how much it would require. Uh, you need to have this flat space time where your ship is, you compress space time in front of you, you extend it in the back so you're not breaking physics. Um, and when they first did the calculation for how much energy that would take, the <laughs> energy came out to be all of it, yeah. all the energy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> not not, not going to happen. <laughs> no. So they have worked it down, but it still is an incredible amount for what we're physically able to contain and maintain these days, unfortunately. We'll get there, though. So even with all these wonderful theories, uh, I imagine we're pretty far away from ever coming close to doing any of these. Pretty yeah. far down the road. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But, you know, uh, I like to say because I studied gravitational waves, so I kind of have a little place in my heart for it. But right. the uh, gravitational wave detection, which was this detection that Einstein had theorized where you perturb space time. So something explodes something may not be perfectly symmetrical as it's rotating, things crash into each other. They give off ripples like you do in a pond. Mm -hmm. um, and Einstein predicted these, you can see it in the math and they are incredibly tiny. But some of your listeners may have found that uh, in 2016, they did actually announce the detection of gravitational waves from the mm -hmm. LIGO collaboration, which was the direct detection of space-time warping. Um, it was the direct detection of space-time itself. Wow. And so I like to say that's that's a pretty good baby step towards being able to warp space-time. You, you learn about something, you directly detect it, and then we learn to play with it. Wow. <laughs> and we'll get we'll get there one day. <laughs> oh, that is so incredible. Now again, I, I just love how you can just explain these really difficult to understand concept in easy to understand terms like you're doing now. Uh, I want to switch gears though. I understand you're the co-host of a uh, podcast called Get Set. Can you tell yes. us a little bit more about that podcast? Yeah, that's correct. So my rocket scientist by day job, um, I work as an aerospace engineer with a company called Angility. Mm -hmm. And a few of us in the company got together and we started producing this podcast called Get Set for Science, Engineering and Technology, mm -hmm. where we explore different avenues of the space industry and things that would be of general interest to the public, things like cybersecurity, things like exploring Mars, stuff that is hot in the industry itself, but where it applies to people in their everyday life. So, um, yeah, so I'm a co-host. So I do every other episode with a, 
a friend of mine, John Amazigo, who's also an employee. And yeah, it's been great. So uh, yeah, if your listeners want to check it out, uh, there's a lot of great episodes. We did one on cybersecurity for the election was our most recent episode. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, that's fantastic. So yeah, definitely go check that out called Get Set. Find it on iTunes. Now, Dr. Aaron, you were recently at Starbase Indy over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, what's next for you? What's coming up for you in 2019? Uh, So the first thing, I'm kicking off 2019 on January 4th on the Star Trek cruise. Awesome. (laughs) So, yes, there are still limited cabins available as of this recording, and uh, it'll be great. I'm coming on as a guest. I'm going to be talking about the physics behind Star Trek. I'm going to be um, discussing the science in Star Trek Discovery with Jason Isaacs and Mary Chifo and Kenneth Mitchell, and uh, just kind of generally being a one of the designated science officers on the crew, along wow. with Dr. Phil Plate, the uh, bad astronomer. So the two of us are going to be bringing science to the Star Trek crews, uh, January 2019. And then I'll be doing, I kind of hit up as many local pop culture, comic con type events as I can. So if any of your listeners are interested in me coming, let your local organizers know, and I would be more than happy to come and bring science and science fiction. Oh, I think that's so cool. And they can find out more about you. Your website is AaronPMcDonald.com. That's correct. Aaron P. McDonald, M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. And then you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Aaron Mack, D-R-E-R-I-N-M-A-C. Excellent. I'll definitely put this in the show notes for this podcast. So check the show notes to get those links. Um, Dr. Aaron, I want to thank you so much for just taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you again for having me. This was really fun. Oh, my pleasure. Online Coffee Break. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation today with Dr. Aaron McDonald. Hope you did too. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like light speed isn't something we'll be able to surpass anytime soon, but boy, will that be a fascinating time when we do. I want to thank Dr. Aaron for joining us today. I want to thank you for joining us today as well. If you'd like to learn more about Aaron McDonald, you can visit her website at AaronPMcDonald.com. That's E R I N P M A C D O N A L D.com. I want to thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to comment on today's topic, just go to our website, onlinecoffeebreak.com, or give us a call at 317-862-4700. We'd also love it if you'd follow us on Instagram at Online Coffee Break. And be sure to rate us on iTunes or share this episode with your friends. Thanks again for joining us today. Live long and prosper. May the force be with you. God bless. See you next time.